Hello, Shamai. It's midday, it's Cardiff, and it's the data webinar. And I'm da, my just ready try Hanner Deed, the Ning Had Deed, the new view, and the Emma and my webinar had data. Well, hello. How are you all out there? I know there's quite a lot of you out there. We were just chatting a few minutes ago to the panel members about the wide range of people listening in today. We have never, ever had such a wide range of delegates. Just going to share with you with a few, right? So naturally, you're going to expect some data specialists and we've got some data scientists um, listening in, which is great. We also have some board members. We also have some chief execs, policy makers, policy shapers. That's what people like to be known as some, in some places. We've got heads of services. We've got directors. We've got service practitioners. We've got some regulators in the UK and abroad. Good afternoon, Malta. I hear it's one o'clock over there. And there's also people who's receiving the services as well. I need to give a couple of uh, particular shout outs to three particular organisations. Cardiff City Council, Ceredigion and South Wales Fire. They've decided to group together and have a training session and listen in all together in one room. So, hello, how are you all? You all right? Um, I'm also very jealous of the email I've just had about the cake that someone's having. They've made ginger cake, especially for that group. Oh, sounds beautiful. Okay, so I'm Ina, I'm part of the Good Practice team. I'm just going to introduce you to the panel, uh, to the members who are behind the, the, um, behind the camera, very important. Miss Sarah is all thing technical. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Then we've got Bethan, who's on Twitter, Michelle, who's on Google, and then a young Bethan, because we've got three Bethans in the room here today, who's picking up on, on the um, email address. So without further ado, let's go and have a chat with the panel to see who's here and what they're about. So. Uh, the third Bethan in the room of equal importance. Would you care to introduce yourself to the delegates? I'm Bethan Smith, uh, as well as uh, Wales Auditors, uh, Audits uh, Bethan Smith. I'm currently on secondment to the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner um, from the County Voluntary Council in RCT, Interlink. Um, I'm passionate about public involvement and, and kind of a hobby data fanatic, so being here is really bringing the two together. Oh, that's lovely. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for your time today. Hello, Ben. Hello. Hello. Um, uh, you want me to introduce myself? I'd be lovely. Uh, so um, I'm Ben Proctor. I work for a company called the Satori Lab based here in Cardiff, but working across uh, the UK and Europe. Um, and um, our mission is to um, uh, learn how to deliver public services in the internet age and then share what we learn. And my particular interest is in how organisations, especially um, public service organisations, can make better use of data. Okay, Ben, thank you for your time. Much, much appreciated. And last but not least, hello, Suzanne. Hello, um, my name is Suzanne Draper. I work for Data Cymru um, as a senior improvement consultant, um, and I am responsible for, excuse me, for overseeing the data collection and data management teams in that organisation. Suzanne, you're very welcome. Okay. I also need to let you know that Professor Tom Crick from Swansea University is also listening in. Now, Tom has got a wide range uh, of it in his profile. He's the Digital Education and Policy at Swansea University. He's also a board member at Dwar Cymru and ABMU. ABMU is short form Abertawe Bromorganog University Health Board. And he also sits on the Data, Digital and Innovation um, for, he does, he's the chair for, sorry, he's the chair for the digital competency framework for all schools in Wales. Wow, so he's keeping us up on the hashtag. So let's see how you can get involved with us because you're actually part of this webinar, right? There's a few ways you can do this. I'm gonna read the board over there. They put it in big writing for me so I can see it. So the hashtag, if you're on Twitter, is WAO data 18 If you would like to email us, it's at good dot practice at wao.gov.uk and no i've given you sorry that's an incorrect that's, I've, I've combined emails address there sorry it's good dot practice at audit dot wales arve dot da at archwiliodd dot cymru os dych am wneud e trwy'r gyfran cymraeg we also if you've got a google email address we've got a google hangout on the side of the of the webinar on youtube you're very, very welcome to do it that way now you can also, if you're on Twitter, but don't want to send us any questions, observations out 
sort of actually on in the hashtag, you can direct message us as well. So I'll just repeat that. You can direct message us if you follow us on our good practice um, email account. You can send us emails in English or in Welsh, and that's at good.practice at audi.wales, arve.da at achwilio.cymru, or on the hashtag WAO data 18. So you are, this isn't a broadcast, this is very much for you to be involved. One third of it is about us chatting here, two thirds of it is getting questions from you. So why data? Why now? Well, when we started, when Sarah and I started doing this research on this topic quite a few months ago, we were chatting to lots of people. And this is one simple thing people are saying, there is so much data out there, people are drowning in it. Where do you start? How do you know you're having the right data to make the right decisions? And that's a really tough call to make. And sort of when we were talking to, when we started talking to the panel members here and saying, look, what should the focus uh, be? The fact that there's so many of you listening in today, this is the range of organisations that are actually listening in today. It goes to show how important you feel this topic is. So we have some really unusual uh, organisations listening in to us today. So we've got some housing associations. We've got colleagues from the Satori Lab listening in. We've got some charities listening in, colleagues from the Data Cymru. We've got local authorities. We've got the National Audit Office in Malta. Good afternoon, folks. Colleagues from Welsh Government. We've got Govar Cymdeith Asol Cymru, that's uh, Social Care Wales, Wales Centre for Public Policy, Natural uh, Resources Wales, Sports Council, WCVA, S Pedwarek. We've got uh, various different police organisations throughout Wales, various different fire uh, and rescue services throughout Wales. That's just to give you a little example of how important data actually is and where it, where it sits to in terms of making decisions. So I'm going to um, share something. I need to give a big shout out. I know you're listening, Louisa, so I don't want to embarrass you, but the lovely Louisa Nolan from the Data Science Camp has written us a great blog. Actually, Bethan, do you want to uh, share that uh, link out to that blog now on Twitter? We will email you all the links that we've talked about today in this webinar. This is what Louisa starts off saying in her um, blog about data. She says, Data is exciting, and these days we can extract interesting information, not just from tables of you know, survey data and management information. Now, they have their place, don't get me wrong, but there's a, such a large way of tools and uh, available to us these days. Data science can give you the tools to rapidly analyse these types of data in ways that wouldn't have seemed possible just even a few years ago. In her blog, she talks about, and the one that I get excited for, and I, because I'm quite a bit of an environmentalist in the quiet, she shows how using Google Street View, right, you can map the urban forests at street level across England and Wales. So I had to have a look into that. So thanks for that, Louisa. So Louisa's really happy for you to get in touch with her. A couple of ways you can do that with that. There's an email address. Can we give a name check, actually, folks, to the email address, address that Louisa's given us? This is all one word. Data Science Campus at ons.gov.uk or their website is again all one word data science campus at ons.gov.uk. We'll push those out on Twitter for you to pick them up on, on that. One more shout out before I come to the panel. The lovely people at the Gwent Strategic Wellbeing Assessment Group, they've done us a vlog on data. Um, Shall we share that as well, folks? Can we give that a push out as well? They're sharing their approach to data and how they've collectively come together to view data for the region of Gwent in terms of the wellbeing assessment. Finally, did you know that the Welsh Government have got a um, consultation out at the moment? They're doing a, re a digital review within Welsh Government. So if you've got some really strong views on this, please have a chat with them. We'll also share the link to the consultation of that one before the end of the, of the webinar, if that's okay. Right, I'm gonna to turn to the panel now then. So let me get, let me find my right question. Um, I'm on the wrong page, which is a good start. Where are we? Okay, here we go. So you can post questions anytime you like. Don't wait for me to shout out. And also I need to let you know that all questions are treated anonymously. If you're thinking about making an observation or a question, I'm not too sure, 
please share it because I'm interested in the question because you're thinking it other people will be as well so Beth can I come to you if that's okay yes. so the first question I want to pose the panel is and it, it's it's actually pertinent we start off with you but one of your hats is representing the future generations office so thinking about the Wales we want by 2050 what role could should data play in that vision okay well i'm going to start off by saying that obviously i do wear many different hats and i'm going to be talking at various different levels from a, a policy perspective um, and as somebody who's worked as a frontline practitioner using data um, so I, I would say for the first a kind of no no brainer um, is understanding where we are now um, in terms of where we want to be i think you know the best place to start is where we are now and data offers us a, a, a fairly good grounding in in what things currently look like um, and, and that can be across a range of, of different areas and i think that data provides us the opportunity to work across silos and understand how things are interacting um, particularly under the, the guise of the um, well-being of future generations act you know a couple of years back you, it wouldn't have been mainstream to consider air quality you know a, a, under a health priority you know yeah. that would be those guys working over there mm -hmm. in, in environments. So I think particularly um, in, in our current um, political climate as well, that actually there's a really valuable thing that data can add. Um, and from there, I would say that um, future trends, you know, at the moment, as things look, if we were to extrapolate, um, what might things look like in 50 yeah. years time? Um, but being mindful, you know, you've got emergence, you've got things that are going to pop up in the next 10, 15 years that are going to come completely left of field. Um, so, so to be open and, 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 you know, consider that those things are probably going to happen. Um, you're going to get thrown off course. So don't be too rigid in the, your, you know, strict yeah. direction of where you're planning on going. Um, and the importance of actually what does data mean when it's trans translated into to lived experience or vice versa? Yeah um so you know you, you can have all the data in the world and it can tell you objectively this is what it looks like out there um but what does that mean to the person on on the other end of the yes, service absolutely we've got a number of um i use the word service users but individuals in receive in, in receipt of services listening in this morning so this, this afternoon it'd be interesting to know what their thoughts are what their experience has been as well happy to hear your thoughts at any time folks and I'm going to discuss that in a little bit more depth in, in one of our later questions. Okay. Um, but, but just to say that actually, you know, da data is, is not the be all and end all. It, it's, it's the, I suppose it's, it's the, the, the transport to get you somewhere. Um, and in terms of thinking about the, the, the five ways of, of working under the Act, that data seems a really sensible place to start. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about sharing data and working around a common data set to, to provide some coherence and actually some some commonality to, to drive that forwards. Mm -hmm. I love that. Data is the transport to get you somewhere. I like that. It's a great way to start. Thanks for that, Beth. And thanks very much. Ben, what's your thoughts on this question? Uh, well, I definitely, I don't disagree with anything that you said. I, 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 so I, I guess I'm, I maybe add some yeah. some colour to that. So um, so the first thing that occurred to me when um, is the kind of how we, what we, what we have in our minds when we see this question. Yeah. And um, and there's a, there's a kind of there's often an idea that data is something that is held um, at some sort of level in organisation. Yeah, so yeah. it's held at, at um, public service board level or it's held at managers level. And so um, so one of the things we I think we need to be looking at is um, do communities have the data, the information that they need mm -hmm. in order to make decisions about their community? Do frontline staff have the information and data that they need? So so. Um, so I just want to kind of make sure that when we when we um, when we're visualising what we talk about in terms of data and especially the context of um, the worlds we want, that that we're really uh, we're really talking about pushing data down to the people who do the work and make the decisions. And then we also we run the Open Data Institute node in in Wales. So I'm also going to emphasise the importance of open data. Okay. Yeah, um, and so uh, the more that Public bodies, and it doesn't have to be um, uh, constrained to public bodies, but public bodies should should lead by example. The more that they share all of the data that they hold, whether or not they think it's going to be useful, yeah. 
um, the the easier it is for everybody to get around the table okay. and and see what they're working on. Um, and I guess just to to reiterate that um, there's a if we're if we're thinking about the world in 2050, yeah. we have to be reasonably humble about the fact that um, we can build models that predict the future, but they will be wrong. Okay. So we should be, and we should build models that predict the future, and we should take a step in that direction, okay. but we should be constantly looking back and preparing to change direction okay. based on the data that we see at that time. Wow. A couple of points Ben raised there. Any observations of what Ben and Beth have already raised? And actually, folks, can we give a shout out to the ODI in Cardiff, the Open Data Institute in Cardiff, because as the you know, good practice team, sharing being open about data is something that we're quite passionate about so thanks for raising that as well so um i've got a couple of questions already coming in from a couple of service users people who are receiving services um they're listening in this morning i, I bet I'm, it's, it's directed at you so i'll come back mm -hmm. to you on that one so suzanne yes just to finish just to, can you bring us uh, your thoughts on this I question can, yeah, thank absolutely. you absolutely and, and surprisingly as somebody who works for a data organization data Cymru, um my belief is that data is fundamental to both to the vision not only in its initial development but also in the delivery of that vision how for instance how do you know you're even delivering against such a vision if you don't measure or monitor it in some way um how do you know what it actually means for you for you for your area for your community if you're not asking people and understanding what their needs are that is data um how do you know what services you can put in place if you don't know how much money you've got to spend for instance you know the, knowing what your budget is and what you've got available to you is data um and how do you actually know whether what you're delivering is actually having the desired uh, results for the, for the population you're delivering for them if you're again you're not monitoring this in some way so it's fundamental much as it is in daily life um and i guess just to reiterate what's been said already what we're talking about isn't only numbers although yes. i do love numbers yeah. yeah um there are lots of different types of information that you need to kind of be considering people's views as i've already mentioned is extremely important and that's not just you know, engagement through surveys, but there are other means, and this is probably what we've been talking about already, that there are lots of different sources of information there that we're only just starting to kind of understand and really scratch the surface of. But um, information that you can get through Twitter, for instance, yes. will give you a feel for what people are actually feeling and what they're concerned about and what their needs might be. Um, we've also mentioned predictions and projections data and as an organization this is something that we're trying to look into over the next couple of uh, weeks and months and years um as ben said you can only ever predict so far before it becomes very tenuous and you don't know what the future looks like but what we're trying to look to do is just be a bit more sophisticated in how we might do that um and some of this um uh, operational um modeling to say if i if i were to do this piece of act, piece of uh, service delivery what would be the impact on that prediction if i did this what would be the impact on what that you know might mean for the population mm -hmm. so this is something we're very much starting to explore um like i say over the next few months and years and lastly the only other point i wanted to make is something about um how do we quantify one of the most difficult things i guess we're going to find especially with the wales we want and the future generations act is that so much of what we're delivering and the initiatives we're putting in place the benefits won't be felt for a long yes. time. How do mm. we quantify now what the outcomes and what the benefits of those might be? Um, and again, that's something that we're starting to look at. For instance, how do you measure social value when it's the impact is felt at an individual level? How do you then build that up to mm. a kind of population um, impact? Um, just a little plug. So our annual conference, our national intelligence event is being held at the end of November. It's very much focused on that issue. It's um, are we making a difference, understanding our impact on well-being? And it's very much focused on looking at how we might be able to quantify and measure and evaluate the initiatives we're putting in place now that aren't easily measurable. OK, actually. Uh, let's send a link out to yes, that um, to that to that conference. Can we send um, a link out to the data um, Cymru event on? Is it the twenty twenty second of November? Okay, that's great. That'd be lovely. Okay, a couple of questions coming in for both you and Ben. Actually, the Beth and Ben about sort of mm -hmm. um, how many organisations are fully 
truly in brackets involving engaging with people who are receiving the services there's there's the term end user that someone's using as well what's what's your feel what's your sense of that can i come to you first beth on this if that's all right yeah um absolutely um and i think the first place to start is that there is no one perfect way of doing it okay um, you know, is, is horses mm. for courses, yeah. you know, everything within its own mm. context, you know, how, how much room for influence and involvement is mm. there, um, or, or, you know, is finance strictly, strictly having yeah. to take precedence, um, you know, not ideal, um, but, but what are organisations in fact doing to, to make involvement as meaningful as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say that, that behind every big statistic and big piece of data, there's in fact thousands of stories okay. um, and, and understanding, um, you know, data from the end user's perspective. So uh, an approach that I'm really keen on personally is, is to, to collect data and, and, you know, present it back to the people who are in fact using the services yeah. and, and to, to clear up if actually as a professional, is my interpretation the same as yours or have, 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 have we got it wrong? Okay. Um, and involving people not only in collecting data from them, but interpreting the data with them. Okay. Um, so some examples, because I know you're wearing a number of hats today. So thinking about some of um, one of your hats that involving with the, the um, RCT, the link, um, RCT link, mm -hmm. you did a piece of work there in, in, in the Rhonda, looking at the older members of the community. Mm -hmm. That was just groundbreaking in terms of the approach. It, often people don't think when you're capturing people's um, views that it's actually data. Mm -hmm. and, and to be able to put some quantifiable data behind that as mm. well. So, so from my experience, what we've done was to skill up some people within the community to collect stories from their friends, families mm -hmm. and other members of the community. Um, every person who shared their story or experience mm. typed in on a, a couple of charts what it meant to them so it was interpreted at the source as opposed to being interpreted by yeah. somebody who's yeah. another step removed mm, um, and then bringing all of that data together as a collective mm. with public services with the third sector and, and the people whose stories mm. you know who, who own these stories who they belong to um, and to be able to have that person okay. in the room to be able to steer public services as to well, actually you, you're not quite getting where I'm coming from here yeah. um, and, and you know it's, it's about having the right people around the table as well as the right data on the table okay so um, we'll get a link to, uh, to that information because that's mm -hmm. publicly available isn't it that'd yeah. be great so we'll, we'll have a chat with you afterwards and share that out Ben did you want to come in on, on the question about sort of how many organizations are fully truly involved in engaging with people who are receiving services so um, so we work a lot with uh, specific public sector organizations mm -hmm. so that's um, that's I guess the, the area that I know most about um, I would say there's a huge range in practice um, there are many public sector organizations that are um, that don't consider these issues at all. Okay ranging to there are public sector organizations that are really trying to find ways to not just uh, engage yeah. users but to co-produce services to design their services yeah. around the needs of service yeah. users i think um there are two things but the the more uh the more you find an organization that is trying the more humble they are about how yeah. effective yeah. they are uh, at that end and I think one of the big stumbling blocks is um, actually, if you want to have conversations with actual people and have those conversations re-inform service design, yeah. Yeah. that's a radically different way of thinking about how you make decisions in your organization. So, so you need you genuinely need to create a way that uh, frontline staff can, uh, one or, or service users can can. Kind of dry restructure the organization okay. around them that isn't how we think about public se sector organizations at all i don't think we we, we, we have a long way to go okay. to be that ambitious okay thanks for that um it would be rude not for me to, to ask you the same question out there are you aware of any organizations who are fully or truly engaging with individuals to help them understand the, the kind of data they actually need if there is please Come back to me, let me know. Email me, good.practice at audio.wales, send it on Twitter, direct message, whatever, or for, on the Google Hangouts. Um, Suzanne, question come in for you on this one. Um, happy for you guys to follow through on this one as well. It's a big question. As you mentioned, 
there can be so much data out there. Yeah, we are drowning in data, mm -hmm. aren't we? How do we know what data is good data? Yeah. Wow, let me give I'm going to give once again, and I'll say it slowly. Um, as you mentioned, there can be so much data out there. How do we know what data is good data? Yeah. Good question. It is a very good question. And, and like most answers, it will start with, well, that depends. Um, but it does. <laughs> it depends on what it is that you are trying to do with that data that will depend, that will determine whether that is the right piece of data for you or not. Um, obviously, good data at the heart of it is data that is accurate and correct. And if you've got any concern for the kind of legitimacy and validity of any piece of information, then you know you may be best to avoid it. Um, but interestingly, I'm going to plug something else again here, that I wrote a blog for um, the WAO yes, back did. in January, which was very much about the top 10 questions you should ask yes. yourself when looking at a piece of data to understand, is that the piece yes. of data that I should be using? And I'm not going to pretend that I can uh, recall of, you know, the whole 10 questions, so we can maybe want to... Uh, yeah, what we'll do then, let's, um, get, let's get that link sent out. Beth, can we, it, it came under the... Uh, scrutiny event. Uh, Michelle, can you pick that up for us? We'll push it out on Twitter now, folks. For those of you who are not on Twitter, we'll send you a link to it, an email. All the links, um, it will be sent in one email at the end of this event, yeah. if that's okay. But essentially, that's founded on the fact that we're all very familiar with Disraeli's um, concept of lies, damn lies and statistics, which suggests that every piece of data is questionable. And it is, as the blog starts, you've just got to make sure that you are asking the right questions when you're using the data. So that sets out the top 10 questions okay. based around, is it useful for me? Will it help me actually answer the questions I'm asking? Is it correct? Is it valid? And it'll take you through those top 10 steps. Thanks. That, actually, that blog is very pertinent. So we'll, we'll push that out again, if that's okay. Folks, do either of you want to come back on, on to follow on from what Suzanne said there? Um, I. Uh, so we, um, earlier in the year, we got some funding from Welsh Government and um, we produced OpenStreetMap Cymru, which is okay. a, um, so it's a Welsh language map of Wales. Yes. And it uses, it's, it's, lovely. it's great, thank yeah. you. Uh, so, but it uses OpenStreetMap data and OpenStreetMap is essentially Wikipedia for maps. Yeah. Um, and you will find in there that there are many place names that are not the same as the list of place names the Welsh Language Commissioner mm. has published, um, but they are the place names that people, volunteers out there put in. So mm. um, who is correct? What is the correct piece yeah. of data? Is it what the community said yeah. it was? Is it what the world said? And I think the answer to that will depend on the context. Okay. Um, that's okay, that's great. I have to say, I think we've hit, an, as one of you has hit a note because we've had a few questions in on GDPR. I have <laughs> to ask this question. I really do. It's really important. So um, I'm going to choose this question, I think, to represent the GDPR. For the others who have sent the questions in on GDPR, if we're not quite covering your angle, come back and let us know. So panel, when considering the GDPR, how do we ensure that the data we're collecting would be useful in future generations to inform change? How do we ensure that data deemed not needed currently isn't lost? So there's two separate questions here. I'll repeat the first one uh, and give you time to have a mm. think. When considering the GDPR, how do we, how can we be sure that the data we're collecting will be useful in future generations to inform change? Well, thank you for that question. I can see the panel, all, my, all three panel members looking at me and I think, <laughs> don't ask me this <laughs> question now, Rita. So uh, anyone willing to have a go for me on this? I know it's a tricky one. I, I would say it's the starting point is make sure you're, you know, you, you consent if it's a survey or, or kind of a, a public facing document that you're explicit as to what you're doing, why you're doing it and what it's going to be used mm -hmm. for. Even if you, you can't be entirely explicit as to in the future, you know, put, put a caveat that says, you know, this may be used um, to inform further work in the future. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you, you don't want to be included in that, then, you know, you, okay. your right is there to. Mm -hmm. to okay. There's the second question about how do we ensure that data deemed not currently isn't lost. What I might do here, uh, we have good friends in the Information Commissioner's Office, mm -hmm. we might tweet that question back out to them to get their view on that one, if, if that's all right, because we're not GDPR experts on this panel here. So, Beth, can we can we tweet that out to the Information Commissioner's Office to ask them to share their view, if that's mm -hmm. all right? Um, I've got one more question coming through very quickly. Any other thoughts before we move on there, folks? 
I, I would like to add something it's just that I think in this day and age with the advent of GDPR I think there has understandably been a lot of nervousness you know it's still in its early days and, and yes the the dare I use the word the threats of kind of not complying and, and are quite strong and it's understandable that people are kind of really nervous about the data but at the very heart of it the GDPR is there in order to encourage better sharing of yes data. So actually, absolutely when it's people are kind of more confident with what it means and what can and can't be done what isn't isn't necessary it isn't isn't useful because my answer to be at both of those questions is it depends on what your definition of useful is in the context of what you're collecting okay. um so i think ultimately it will actually have a really positive effect okay. because if as citizens as, as okay. people whose data might be collected on if we're much more reassured and confident that it's going to be used in the most appropriate ways and not shared immorally then we'll be much more happier as you say to share it and as long as we understand what that looks like with the you know the privacy policies and whatnot i think it will ultimately have the, the desired, yeah, exactly. it will have the desired benefit on it and sort of you know the information commission has gone on record to say they're there to help exactly so you know th th we haven't yeah. got a problem and with i think that. if you if you're worried then ask the advice from yes, the professionals so don't let it put you off don't let it be a barrier to no. to get the well, information you need so i guess if i if i understand the subtext of that, of that question it's mm. it's really asking so the gdpr makes you get rid of personal data yes um when you as quickly as possible basically so yeah. um and and so like there's so that creates a theoretical problem that we might gather personal data now mm -hmm. and if we held it for 10 years in 10 years time we might have some more data that where that would be useful mm -hmm. well up until about two years ago i'd spent my life in local government and uh, the whole of my career there were spreadsheets and mm -hmm. databases full of data that people were holding because it might be useful mm -hmm. and it never was so i think i personally think mm -hmm. that that's a highly theoretical problem, and I would rather that we got rid of personal data that we didn't. Like, I'd rather that we have the the the, the potential opportunity cost yeah. than we carry the risk right and now. And of course, you don't have to retain it as personal data. If you were to create aggregate data on the personal data, then you, you're catching out the issue of GDPR, and you yeah. can keep that data. Then, I mean, okay. you know, storage suggestions would mean that you still want to clear it out regularly. But there are ways to retain the intelligence that's without right. retaining the personal data. That's it. actually that's a good bit of practical advice. Metrics, that's the other buzzword that's coming through on the on, on the on the questions here. Beth, mm -hmm. what do the what's the panel's view on the matters of importance are too subject to judgment and interpret, interpretation to be solved by standard metrics? I'm repeat that question mm -hmm. again very slowly. What's your view on matters of importance are too subject to judgment and to interpretation to be solved by standardised metrics? Now, I have to say, could you start off for me, because I'm not in the, your world of metrics. Give us, I understand the concept of metrics, but in plain English, what are we talking about by metrics here first? Then go on to the question, if, if that's OK. So, yeah, numbers, hard data, you know, as, as you traditionally think of data. Um, and I'll go on a little bit of a spiel about kind of your, your qualitative data, which is narrative, which is context, is soft, is, is you know, relatable, it feels very human. Um, mm -hmm. You've got your, your quantitative and your, your met, um, metrics type data, which, you know, really nice to, to make clear statements about, um, possibly oversimplified statements if we're not very careful as to how we approach it. Um, but it gives you scale, okay. um, which, which the, the personal stuff can't give you scale in, in any kind okay. of really... Do you want to give me for, for example, just to talk me yeah, for an example, yeah. if that's OK? Um, so, yeah, when, when, when you, you're using narrative data or stories or personal experience, mm -hmm. what you're given is context, and that, that's fundamental to, to something having meaning. Okay. So it's, it's what's the sentiment, what does that mean to me? Yeah. Um, and if you want something to be meaningful, you want it to have meaning. <laughs> yeah. But then thinking about kind of the metrics approach, um, you know, you've got scale, you've got kind of quite clear parameters as to what you're dealing with. Um, but particularly thinking forwards when you've got things like computer science and AI and, and, and actually looking at being able to understand sentiment mm -hmm. through quantitative data, mm -hmm. and actually going forward that, you know, meaning on a mass scale is going to become significantly mm -hmm. more, you know, possible. Um, and it's not about just a case of what works, but but why it works as well. Okay. Um, 
so 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 what and the why i'm hearing mm -hmm. there then okay yeah i think that's the key thing is you yeah. know, any one piece of data or type of data will never give you a full picture it will only give you a very one-sided view it's about yeah. bringing all of those different types okay. of information together to give you a less than or a more subjective but mm -hmm. yeah less mm -hmm. and, and I, I think kind of what the question is kind of gearing towards there is how can you know people's lives and, and services and end users don't always fit neatly within an excel no. spreadsheet no. Um, and to recycle a quote that i've said before what's normal for the spider's chaos for the fly you know if, oh wow if, if, if you can gonna... repeat that stuff. <laughs> i've got to tweet that i went out uh, so, so what's normal for the spider's chaos for the fly so you know whatever you're putting into a system you know it might be the same thing but by the time it's gone through the machine that they've come out two very different things okay. um and, and likewise, you know, people might access the same service, but for de very different reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've recently been um, doing some consultation around transport mm -hmm. and speaking to some older people as to, you know, their thoughts and feelings about the bus service locally. And a, a couple of them went on the bus ride for, for somebody to talk to. It wasn't because they had an end destination. Mm -hmm. You know, for them, a, a bus ride is a, a, it's a social event. Mm -hmm. Whereas for, for me, you know, I, I wouldn't get on a bus unless, you know, I had somewhere to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's understanding that the, the meaning and the mm -hmm. sentiment behind it is, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to actually ask, I know there's a number of colleagues from the data scientist campus listening in. Have you got any links that we can use on metrics to share with people who are not across this? It'd be really helpful for us to share that, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Ben, I've got a couple more questions. We've got time. Any responses you want to make to add on to what Beth said there? Can we move on? Uh, that seemed very thorough. Thank I've, you very um... much. Thank you. Thank you. One more question, because I'm conscious of, of time, um, is um, how can we encourage public confidence in our data? This is a really, mm. really good question, because you can imagine organisations making major decisions on what data that they've been given. But thank you for this question. really appreciate it. That, um, because and also as well, when you think there's a number of organisations listening in who are partnership bodies and they're using data to make um, pretty major decisions here in terms of the direction, in terms of when you think about 2050, your point about the fact that sort of yeah, data is, you know, what it is now is not going to be on the projections. So panel, I'd like an answer from every one of you, if, if that's OK. What's your perspective on how can we encourage public confidence in our data? Can I start? Absolutely, with you, yeah. Thanks. I think the key thing for me is just to be open and transparent about your data, about what you're using. What's and all, if that is the case, but actually, if people can see what it is that you're using, they know what you're using, they can have an impact and an input mm -hmm. into what you're using, they can work with you to improve the data if it needs improving. I mean, GDPR, again, allowing being more open and being transparent about what you're using and what decisions you're making as a result of that data. Is fundamental. That's a really good response to that one. Yeah, it's common sense in some ways, isn't it? What you just said there. Open data. Uh, yeah. So I would um, I would say absolutely. Um, if you publish your data um, by default, it becomes much easier for people to interrogate it. Mm. Um, but I'm interested, I guess, in slightly beyond that, why organisations don't. And I think. So I used to work for a local authority in England. Um, we, and I did public relations work, yeah. um, and periodically our economic development team would, would phone me up and say, get a press release out because um, people are saying there are lots of clothes shops in one of our town centres and there aren't. And they counted every month the number of clothes shops, but I could never persuade them that they should publish that number. If they published that number for three years, people would get would develop confidence in that number and then yeah. when we said yeah. look that's okay. the so that, that, that there's there's a there's an argument there and also i think the reality is that often public bodies are not using the data mm -hmm. to make decisions about mm -hmm. and so it's not surprising that people mistrust the yeah. data and the organization because they don't seem to correlate at all yeah fair comment actually so your plea is publish your data make it open Yes, that's your that's, that, that, yeah, that, I, I, that's could, your I could leave now. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's your plea. But that's your plea, though, isn't it? And it makes it makes life so much easier. Have the confidence to publish your data yes. and share. It's good to share. OK, Beth, I'll um, come to you on this for, one. For me, I, I, I would echo um, transparency. Okay. Um, so why have we got the data? What are we doing with it? What, what, what are the potential uses of it even? 
um, just to understand the scope of it as well. Because um, if people recognise how it could impact them on a personal level, they're far more inclined to say, oh, well, that makes sense. And actually mm -hmm. communicating about, you know, mm -hmm. data being a bit more, you know, person focused mm -hmm. with it. Um, it's, it's not just a technical, you know, a slot over here, do data, you, you lot just put up with the consequence. Um, and for me as well, I think it's the opportunity for other people to get involved yeah. in looking and understanding that data. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm conscious of time. I've got one more question just come in. Uh, there's a number of questions that come in from partnership organisations and people working in partnership. I'm going to choose this question here and it says, do you have any tips or links to general data collection for geographical areas to avoid duplication of work? So I'll read it slowly again, if that's okay. Any tips, links to general data, data sorry, for general data collection for geographical areas to avoid duplication of work? Right. <laughs> right. So I'm going to add, well, I can answer it based on my understanding. Yeah. But apologies if I'm not. Sorry, right, give them it. your understanding first and say yeah. if that's where you're coming from. Because if it's not, come back with us and clarify <laughs> yes, if that's okay. Yeah. You, yeah. Maybe uninteresting. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that that might mean, do we have any links to data that is collected on different geographical regions that, so that you don't have to go out and get the data yourself, but you actually can go and find data at various different geographical regions. Apologies if that's not right. Um, but what it's I would okay. say well, is... We, what we yeah, say, is that, is that where you're coming from? Let us know. Send us a clarification. If we're, if we're spot on, great. If we're not, send us a clarification. Or we can be asking yeah, you know, yeah. inter interpreted that differently. Okay. Uh, but yes, there are lots of websites available where one of ours, um, one of Data Cymru's is InfoBase Cymru. It's our public facing dissemination tool and that is aimed at, um, well, it contains data that on a variety of different themes and it's, it's our one-stop shop, I guess. A good starting point for if you're looking for data about different geographical areas, local authorities largely, but where data does go down to lower lower geographical areas, then we will include that as well. So what it's, and it's a starting point for the type of data you might be interested in um, across a variety of themes, as I say. And what I would say, start there. And then um, what we do in the metadata, we publish the source of that information. So if you are interested in trying to find out a little bit more, dig a bit deeper, then you can find out where you okay. might go. And Let's give a name check then, shall we? Shall we give a name check? So it's InfoBase Cymru. InfoBase Cymru, okay. Thanks for that. No um, I've got so many more questions coming in, folks. Can I move on? Or have you, are, are you got a burning response? Uh, well, just uh, two quick examples. Uh, so we're working just across the border with a charity called Brightspace. Yes. Um, and they have built a community data store, yes, they have. Um, which is designed for um, uh, community organisations, um, uh, uh, charitable organisations, yes. to just who, who have some data to upload that. I'm hoping that the Guild of Guides in Hereford City right. are going to start publishing their visitor numbers into okay. that. So that, that so that's that's a that's an example right there. Let's and it was free. Check. Check. We used a thing called Data Hub. So it's Brightspace Foundation is the charity. Okay. The service we used was DataHub.io, okay. free to use. Okay. Um, and also Google now has a specific data search function. Mm -hmm. So it's perhaps less like the historically we used to worry a lot about where should we put the data yeah. so it can be findable. Yes. It's much easier to find it now. So right. if it's on the internet. That, that, that's the first thing, stick it on the internet somewhere. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. Um, I've got a um, couple of questions about quality here, um, about the variability of data quality. So I'm looking to start off with that. So, okay, Beth, give you time to have a think. Um, using data can sometimes be challenging due to variable data quality, which is often a shared responsibility. This is another partnership question. Any practical tips the panel can share towards tackling this? I'll repeat it slowly. Mm -hmm. Using data can sometimes be challenging due to variable data quality, which is often a shared responsibility. Any practical tips to share towards tackling this? I would be keen to start with the shared responsibility bit. Okay. Um, if, if there's clearly a, a, an issue around data quality between mm -hmm. departments or organisations, then I, I'd suggest that you actually sit down and okay. discuss what those problems or, or issues are. Okay. Um, in terms of you know practically ironing them out, mm -hmm. um, and understanding that if if other organisations or partners are collecting things in a different fashion to you, why is that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and and using that as a, a starting point to address the issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I am actually going to pose that question back out to you there, that a number of organisations listening in are working in partnership. I'm sure this is not unique to the person who just sent that question in. Wonder what you're doing about it. I'd love mm -hmm. to hear your observations. Mm -hmm. Please share with us. So email us good.practice audit audit.wales adver.da at achwilio.cymru put it on twitter direct manage, or, or direct messages if that's okay I'd love to know because i'm sure you know that's not that's not mm. the only person that deals with that mm. i'm conscious of time folks and i want to get to my favorite question of this i love this question the second question i'm going to pose to the panel is what culture stroke leadership around data do we need to get there so Ben, I'm going to kick off with you on this one. What culture stroke leadership around data do we need to get there? Okay, so uh, I've got three quarters of an hour to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> if you can do it slightly less, be very helpful. Thank uh, you. Yeah, so this is my, um, uh, this is the kind of cultural aspects of the stuff in my obsession. So um, yeah, you will have to cut me off in a moment. Okay. Um, so I guess the, the, the way I think about this question is, First of all, to think about data maturity in organizations. So organizations can be more or less sophisticated in their use of data. At the low end, organizations uh, don't use ev evidence at all in their decision making. They use professional expertise. They use what, what happened before. Um, if they start to take a step up the data maturity ladder, then they start to use some evidence to review the consequences of the decisions they took. And that tends to be quite slow and not very effective and then as they get more practice that becomes slicker and you get sort of halfway up the data maturity ladder yeah. and you 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 can you're on top of your data you're handling it in real time and then beyond that you start you can potentially build models of the future yeah. you can build ever more sophisticated modeling so um so that's kind of in a sense that's what we're trying the the, the subtext of this this whole discussion is how do we move up that ladder okay um, You've got a blog that's, that highlights this really well, haven't you? We could push that out. Oh, please. Shall we? Shall we push that blog out on the date? Uh, the uh, awesomeness one. Shall we push that one out? Sarah's smiling at me. She's obviously already on it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Please continue. Apologise. Um, and I guess because um, when we talk about data, we tend to be talking uh, to a lot of people like us who like numbers and spreadsheets and graphs and that sort of thing. We, the sort of presumption is that to move up the ladder, you need to focus on the skills, the tech. Yeah. Um, but my experience, and I think there's good theoretical reason for it, is actually you need to fo focus on the culture. That yeah. it, to move up the ladder, you need to create an environment where everybody comes into work every day and they say, this is what I got wrong yesterday. Okay. And uh, hierarchies mm -hmm. left to their own devices hierarchies make it very unsafe for people to do that. Wow. Um, Who'd have thought in a data webinar that we'd be talking about that in today? That's a cracking answer. Thank you. Takes you different places, doesn't it, data? Who knew? <laughs> it is, as you said, only it's the tra it's a transport to get you to somewhere, isn't it? Mm. Thanks for that. That's a really good answer. Thank you. Suzanne? Okay. Um, I don't think it's yeah, echoing what Ben said here, I think that the key thing is that you have a culture and a, a leadership in particular that actually values data, that is bought into the power of data. You know, yes, there's lots of um, stuff that we can do with data and ways in which we can do it, but if you're not bought into that power of data from the very wow. offset, then it's Love that potentially statement. quite futile, maybe. Um, it's not easy. Nobody's pretending it's easy. It can be difficult to know where to start, as we've already said. Mm -hmm. The amount of data, the availability of data these days is so much that you can often be drowning in data, but with very little insight being gained from it. Um, so there are just a few kind of hints and tips of where you might start really on this kind of ladder. I think what we'll what we've seen and what there will be is that there will be pockets of um, people, pockets of departments, certain departments, individuals even within your organisations already who are already doing some of this, that have the skills to be looking at data, that understand data and are starting to do new and innovative things with it, that are starting to actually appreciate what data can do for them and are trying to really use it and embed that within the, the, the smaller pockets of culture, should we say. Um, and I think as a, as a leadership, what we need to be doing is identifying that and sharing that knowledge, allowing those people who already are doing some of this work and have some of these skills to inspire others within your organisation and 
you do that by whatever communication methods you've got available to you from the top to the very bottom throughout just starting to push what can be done and really really harnessing what is already being done and we've already talked about the kind of partnership working but it's not just internally share it externally inspire your partners and again there are, there are methods and meetings and all sorts of ways in which you might be able to do this but don't keep it to yourself really start sharing the learning and sharing what it is that you're able to do with data um don't be afraid to ask for help i think in organization and culture yeah. a leadership that isn't afraid to ask for help you know we aren't all experts in this area but there are organizations that do contain experts in this area i would obviously be saying that data company is one of those um but don't be afraid to ask for help there will be people that can help you through mm. wade through the kind yeah. of lake of data that you might be finding yourself in and that's exactly what we are here to do and to help you with um and the most important thing for me is that it's a culture of leadership that allows people real time to do this work yeah. It's not just an add-on to the day job. It's not just something that you have to do as well. People need real time if you want to get real results. Do you know what? I am so glad that this webinar has been recorded because there's some real pearls of wisdom coming out from you, uh, from you, from the panel. Thank you for this. Thanks, Beth. Um, for me, I would say bravery. Um, yeah. You know, to say that look, this is what I can do with data. But actually, alongside that is that you need the space to be able to do that without the, the threat of, of persecution yes, or, or, you know, um, complete disaster. Um, so start starting small, safe to fail mm -hmm. um, and actually involving kind of incrementing more and different people each time you're doing it. Um, and on that point, I would say that um, one of the, the most valuable parts of data is it's not always the, the data in its raw format, but it's actually the public facing side yes. or the, the in, mm. in infographics yes. it's mm. gis mapping yes. it's interactive yes. things yeah. that, that people can relate to not just the numbers behind mm. what Absolutely. goes on there and you know that there is certainly a, a specialist skill that we need to be you know mm. looking at developing but is there a, a gap in in our kind of skill set in terms of translating that into um you know between kind of the the accessible and, and friendly side from the, the hard and raw data from mm -hmm. my personal experience mm -hmm. having worked um, as a community development worker with a tech team mm -hmm. um, that actually you know it's very difficult to kind of cross that that space between speaking in in solid terms of data and and what an end product might actually look mm -hmm. like um, so I would say you know involve your unusual suspects mm -hmm. yeah get yeah people like that involved from the off so Bearing in mind, we've got a wide range of people listening in here, thinking about services that are being delivered in partnership. Would this something you'd be adding on to what you've just said? Because given that they're, they're asking that question, there's obviously something that they're feeling that they needs to be added on to it. Do you get that sense? Because if you, the reality is public services are more and more services are going to be delivered in partnership. Mm -hmm. We are tending still to be talking from the mindset of a single organisation. Mm. Put yourself in the shoes of individuals delivering in a partnership approach, a service mm. in a partnership approach. So, so yeah, I take it further than that. So I think we, when we think about organisations, mm -hmm. we tend to think of machines. So we have this, we and and so we have this idea that uh, at the top of the uh, at the top of your public service hierarchy there is uh, someone who's control pulling the levers and, and even though anybody who's ever worked in public services knows that's not anything like the reality that's still mm -hmm. how we tend to think about these things and then when you talk about partnerships you talk about partnerships between organizations it's like these machines uh, mm -hmm. have come together yeah. but actually the reality is what we have is a, is a network of human beings yeah um we and 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 if you want if we want practice to change if we want thing outcomes to be different those human beings need to be behaving differently mm -hmm. um those human beings mostly in my experience want to behave differently it's not that they don't they don't they're not waiting for someone at the top to pull a lever to force them to behave differently they are constrained yeah. by a whole set of things not just the organization okay. um but when we talk about data i, I think we should really but the starting point i think should be forget about the partnership the people, so I'm the service users, the communities, the people on the front line, do they have the information they need to do their, do, do their job? And then if they have the information they need to do their job, 
are they able to change their behavior in, based on that information? That would be my starting point. Okay, thanks, sir. Beth, you were wanting to come in. Before I forget, there's a mere come in. What's the portal that you share all your data companies that the open? Or it's InfoBase Company. InfoBase Company. Yes. Okay, cool. Lovely. Beth, you wanted to come back in on this one. Um, yeah, just, just using data as, as the, the kind of baseline and the, the, the kind of pers perspective kind of opportunities. Um, I, I always encourage yeah. people to ask that you using data, you know, what, what's possible? Um, based mm -hmm. upon what we're already doing, mm -hmm. what is possible? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the probable outcome of what we're doing? Um, you know, if we if we carry on on the journey in the same direction that that we're going, you know, what is the pro probable option and what is preferable? You know, and what can you do then to you know gear things to be preferable as opposed to just possible? Okay, thank you for that. Thanks, Beth. I just want to say we had a couple of emails in. I'm going to give a few shout outs um, in response to my earlier request. Happy for you to post, keep posting them in, and I will drop them as they uh, name drop them as they come through, and we'll also share them back out on Twitter. In North Wales, there's a rural housing enabler is using data to inform on housing needs in rural communities. So that's a call the rural housing enabler, folks. Michelle, can we push that out on on Twitter if that's okay? Lovely. Um, and yes, anybody else out there that's happening and we want to give us a name check? Because the more the merrier, if that's all right. Right. Quick question to the panel. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do the panel think is the best course of action to foster a culture where an organisation is comfortable with failure? Hmm. There's a second part to this. If it is used as a basis for learning, in particular in regarding to the expectations on public sector delivery, so I'll read that again slowly. I'm looking for Beth for you to kick off on this one, if that's okay. What do the panel think is the best course of action to foster a culture where an organisation is comfortable with failure? If it is used as a basis for learning, in particular, in regards to the expectations on public sector delivery, I have to say, that's a corker of the question, mm -hmm. really corker. Do you want to... Minute or so to yeah yeah. Are you happy to go on this one? Um, I I would start with saying start small. Um, you know, keep it safe, as so that you know if things do go wrong, it's not going to cause World War Three. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think it takes an awful lot of trust in your fellow colleagues, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that will come down to culture. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, by me saying that I've done this, it's gone wrong, but what can we learn from this next time? Yeah. Is is mm -hmm. would be the, the clear start mm -hmm. in the space. Um. And actually celebrating when things have gone wrong. Yeah, actually, right. stop, stop squirreling it away. And, Absolutely. And, you know, mm -hmm. this is not about my mm -hmm. ego and me doing something wrong. This is about the end user mm -hmm. and making sure that we're making things better for them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would give a name check out to the Bromford Lab in Bromford Housing. They've done some great work. Beth, will you pick up on some of the work they do? They do a lot of experimental work, safe to fail, and they share their learning. They... The, the, the focus or isn't on the word failure, the focus is on the word learning. So if we can, um, Paul Taylor from Bromford Housing is someone that sort of uh, the good practice team always look to read his blogs and we'll give, we'll give him a shout out on that one. Suzanne, can I come back to Absolutely. you on this question if that's all right? Yeah, so I think that if, if it is a culture that you want to foster where people have space where you can practice some of this, mm -hmm. it is about ensuring people are, um, mm -hmm. it's not like a broken record, but it's ensuring that people do have the time and, and the place in which they can test, that you're not testing things out mm. in a live environment, so you are going to mm. cause World War yeah, Three. Yeah. It's about saying, let's start small, as you said, and identify mm. somewhere where we need to do something better. And let's, over here, be testing something out, trying things out, seeing why they failed, mm. revisiting it, understanding and learning why we failed, mm -hmm. and eventually delivering something that's much better. It's through, an, you know, that's how innovation works. Absolutely. It's about time and space mm -hmm. to, to allow people mm -hmm. to do that. And in the good, before I come to you, Ben, if that's okay, I will say as well, in the good practice team, we have a number of shared learning, learning seminars across um, across the year. And we really celebrate sharing the learning from any projects to sort of just to, in order to make sure that people are wholly aware of it. So it's something that we feel very strongly about. Sharing their learning is is the basis of what we're actually about. So Ben, coming over uh, So you, I'm going to slightly disagree with my Absolutely fellow panelists right. for, for the first that. time. Um, uh, so I, I'm not convinced about starting small. Okay. Um, so you know I'm going to have to ask you why then, don't you? So so I think so so this has described is the whole ball game. If public if 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 
we have public services, but where it is not safe for people to turn up and say, this is what I got wrong yesterday. Public services will not improve. Public services will not change. Things will not change for service users. Things will not improve the community. So this is, but this is, and nobody who works for public services that I've ever met is stupid or wants to do a bad job. Yeah. So the fact that, the, we, that, that this is a challenge means that this is a real challenge. Okay. And it ha for me, it has to, you, you, have to com you have to persuade a very large proportion of the organization to behave differently. Okay. That is something that you can only do at scale. It requires uh, leadership interventions. So, so we need to see leaders constantly saying, I don't know how to do this. Okay. Um, we, need, we need people to be rewarded when they turn up and say, this is what I got wrong yesterday. And, and crucially, we need within organizations, every, because that we, we tend to talk about leaders like they are sitting on top of the machine, they just pull it, mm -hmm. they just pull their failure lever. And then, but leaders are just people within the network. They have, you know, they have some influence, but we need to have people within organizations talking to each other all the time. Mm -hmm. And it will take a long time, require a very concerted effort. But okay. I would start big, not small. Okay, so what are your thoughts on what you've just heard the panel sharing there? Do you want to share your observations with me, if, with me, if that's okay? A couple more questions, panel. I'm conscious of, of time. Let's go to the first one. Um, we have this on Twitter, actually. How do you transform data into, 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 into information and then share the knowledge? I'll repeat that again because I was stumbling there mm -hmm. a bit. How do you transform data into information and then share the knowledge? Who wants to pick up on that one first for me? I know there's some elements of it that we've picked up on, but can we can condense some of our responses to focus because mm -hmm. there's a slightly different angle of, the, of that question that, that's been asked there, isn't there? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, trans transferring, translating data into intelligence is largely about the interpretation okay. and how you look at the data and what you need to see. But I think what we touched on before is um, largely the way in which we can do that and help people to do that is through how we present it in the first place. So I think you were talking earlier about, um, it's not just looking at raw numbers, it never is. It's about how can we paint the pictures with the yeah. numbers, if you like, um, to actually help people understand what it is. So you're never looking mm -hmm. at a table of data, nobody get, get, gets mm -hmm. anything from a table of data. How can we actually put that data out so that it becomes information? And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that obviously is Data Cymru. Um, we are, it's our remit about putting data and intelligence at the heart of public sector delivery, helping organisations use and understand data better. Um, so I think that's a bit, and how do we share the knowledge? Again, I, it depends on exactly what you're talking about, but you know, as an individual organisation, as, as an individual organisation that is part of a partnership, there are ways and means in which we can share that at a local level. On a national level, it's all about what we do. How do we get the information out there? How can we ensure that data isn't just numbers, but that it is information and intelligence. Okay. Thank you. Beth, you want to come back? Um, I'm, I'm going to add the, the, the idea of metadata, um, okay. which for people who, who aren't familiar is data on data. Um, okay. <laughs> the sort of thing that us guys really like, but most people think is horrific. Um, and disclosing some of that as well, um, you know, it helps you define some of the context around Absolutely. what you're presenting as well. Okay. Um, and, and doing it in a language that is accessible, that mm. you don't have to be expert in order to understand mm. it or apply it or so use right. it, because at the end of the day, it becomes useless if it's, if it's you know. So where, what, what sort of, give me an example where you've actually used that, because I'm interested to see how, I've never thought of it in data on data. Mm. That's quite a, an interesting concept. And I'm going, oh, I want to know more about mm. that. So <laughs> is it an example that you can give some people listening in and going, oh yeah, okay, I get that. Okay, so for an example of where I've done it, um, collecting stories, um, people then tag what that story means to them. Okay. Um, but then when, once all of the, those quantifiable figures are, are kind of abstracted mm -hmm. and, and looked at as a whole, um, it's data upon the data set if you're using the story as kind of the primary piece of data. Um, so it can tell you things about, it gets quite technical at this point, but it can tell you things about where the data has come mm -hmm. from, where it what it means okay. it was originally come from libraries really? um, so, so library cards that tell you you know ah, i get it i've got it from. pennies dropped yeah, you know, yeah you know, find what bookshelf yeah. it came from and what exactly room. it's as simple as the name of the data item you're looking at to the detail of what's included and what's not included okay. the source of it all okay so if you're someone that's sort of um redesigning a service 
co-production how would that what how would that help them can you give me an example it, it would certainly be useful in terms of understanding as people have mentioned earlier the quality of the data mm -hmm. Um, okay. the relevance of it, how, how, how new, how old is it, you know, okay. how, how relevant is mm. it to this circumstance. Okay. If you're bringing data together from different sources, you'll know how it might link together based on the definitions and the kind of guidance that you, in the description that you okay. put behind the data. Um, and just uh, because we're going off on a slightly nerdy track, um, <laughs> uh, so the, there is, um, uh, there's, a, there's a whole way of presenting data on the internet that um, puts the metadata alongside, it's called linked data. It puts the metadata alongside the, the, okay. the data and it enables you to link data sets together, okay. it enables computers to link data sets together without the humans having to do the work. Okay. And we're very much at the at the early stage of exploring that, but that's when you start doing that, you really okay. unlock the... Right, I need to find, I need to team to find um, some link for us so we can share that for the people like myself who are going, okay, I'm at the edge of my understanding on this <laughs> one now, so they can put that into context, that'd be great. But we've got quite a few more questions coming in, folks, so we've got to move on. Right, I have a really deep question for you here. Mm. Take a deep breath. How can you ensure that data collected is proportional to the community you're looking at? And then in brackets, they've said, i.e., if the data received is disproportionate and, le and leans towards certain groups. I'll repeat that slowly again. Mm -hmm. How can you ensure that data collected is proportional to the community you're looking at? That is, if the data received is disproportionate and leans towards certain groups. <sighs> okay. Beth, Suzanne, do you want to pick up this first, <laughs> Ben? I, I would start by saying that un, under the definition of involvement, it, under the, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, that it, it asks that if people are involving um, stakeholders, that they, they do involve a, as, as much as possible a representative mm -hmm. uh, sample of, of the people who are going to be impacted by whatever decision or, or thing you're implementing. Um, I think it's valuable in having the data because, it, it for one, it gives you the ability to recognise who have we talked to, um, and having it in, you know, some informed way that actually we can recognise that we've, we've over or underrepresented this group. Whereas if we just oh, had yeah, a, a splat that. of data, then th there's no saying who or where it's come yeah, from. Yeah. Um, so actually it's, it's, it's the, the fundamentals of, of actually being able to address mm. that question is by having it in, mm. in data Absolutely. format. Okay. Um, and yeah. then you can start getting clever as to how you might weigh things, um, which I, I would too say is more inclined to talk about. Yeah, there are yeah. yeah, statistical um, methods for um, kind of evening out the disparities, the, the disproportionate okay. um, information that you might get. And um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is it a, we can send some links afterwards if we can show how that sort of. The we can is that all provide right? some more information. Would that yes. be all right? Is that okay? It's lovely. And I've got a couple of other, do you want to come back in on this one? Because I would just be agreeing what I would okay, be. Okay, that's, that's fine. Okay, right. I've got a shout out here. Uh, thank you very much for this. It's from Social Care Wales. They're developing a national social care data set for Wales. Um, we'll send the link out to you, to you now. It's www.socialcaredata.wales forward slash IAS forward slash They've asked, can you have a look at it? And they'd really welcome some feedback on it. So um, I think that's an, that is an I there, isn't yes, it? Yeah, yeah, right, okay. Yeah. So it's www.socialcaredata.wales forward slash IAS forward slash. Have a look at it. Mm. Let them know what you think, happy, happy to do that. Okay, I'm conscious of, of, of time folks, because I really want to get onto this last meaty question here. And folks, Hearing what um, the panel members have just said, any thoughts, any observations? Do you need clarity on it? Come back to us and let us know if that's okay. So we're really getting down to the brass tacks of turning what we're talking about into reality here. Suzanne, I'm going to kick yeah. off with you if that's all right. Yeah. We're going to be talking about sort of skills and tools. I want to know from your perspective, put yourself in the shoes of the people listening in. Mm -hmm. What skills and tools will they need to get to the point of, and I want you to sort of try and give me an examples of why you're saying those particular skills and tools, if, that, okay, if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah. So um, for me, it's all about focusing on the fundamentals. Yes, there are new technologies that are available that will allow us to analyse data better. There are data, you know, and the analytical skills that 
people are new. But as I've said previously, unless you're actually brought into the power of data and willing to understand the value of data, then all of those things are futile. They won't ever end up with being used and making a difference because you're not brought into it. So I think what I want to do is take a step back from that and okay. say, let's focus on what the fundamental kind of skills are when you're looking at data. Um, and I've got a list of five. So Thanks. lovely. Um, the first one that I think of is um, be curious. As somebody Ooh, looking at data, be curious. Okay. Ask questions. No yeah. one piece of data, no one type of data is ever going to give you the full picture. Dig deeper. Why is the personal favourite of mine? Why is it like that? Why is it doing that? And it's only by digging deeper, looking at more data, that you'll actually really understand and you'll get to the heart of the issues and be able to deliver services or design services that really get to the heart of these issues. Um, you'll be focused on the prevention rather than the cure if you want to look at it in that way. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, the second really important thing is when you're looking at data and, and wanting to use data is be clear about what it is that you want to know. What are the, what's the question that you're trying to ask? We've talked a lot about the, the amount of data that's available. How can I understand what is important and what's not? It's about being clear about the question you're trying to answer. If you know that, then it should be easier, not foolproof, but easier to say, right, that piece of information is actually going to help me and do that. That isn't. Um, we've touched on this before. Be brave, be bold. Yeah. Don't be afraid to try different things with data. You know, it, they, they may be mistakes that are made with it, but largely that's about how innovation works. Don't shy away from just trying things out. As long as yeah. we talked about, we've got this culture that allows us to do that. Um, but with the being brave and the being bold, it does come the need to be data savvy. And yeah. that's not saying anybody, everybody needs to be a mathematician or a statistician or even just a data geek like me. It's about having a basic understanding, a basic knowledge of what data is, what it is you're looking at and how you might use it. And again, I'd just hark back to that um, blog as yes. a starting point that I wrote about, you know, the top 10 tips for how to use data. That'll help you just think about being a bit more data savvy. And give you confidence, because not everyone Absolutely. is yeah. confident when yeah. they see the data. Absolutely. You know, there's some, you know, people are doing some great jobs out there and they bring, you know, great, great mm. things to the table. Data is not their thing. And, and you know, it, it just yeah. helps to understand. Yeah, I'm feeling giving yeah, that absolutely. confidence. Absolutely, that's yeah. what it was designed for. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, and the last thing for me is about being prepared to act. Simply looking at the data, understanding it, and then moving on is not what this is about. The data, the fundamental um, aspect of this uh, webinar is about how can we use data to yes. underpin the decisions that we're making. You have to be prepared to act. If nothing else, there are organisations that can help you with your understanding of the data there are organizations that can help you with all of this what your skills are where you have to really focus is on doing something with it using the information to actually make a difference wow thank you for that <laughs> Suzanne. thanks beth can i come to you on this one um yeah i i would say that communication is, is one of my yeah. biggest um kind of bugbears around the whole data issue in that it becomes a very closed and specialist field um, if, if we're not very careful um, and, and particularly thinking kind of towards the future where algorithms and, and computer science, AI are going to be significantly better than us at interpreting data. Mm -hmm. It's actually what, what is it that the complementary human mm -hmm. skill that can be applied to that to, to give it its best use and that's interpreting it into lived, um, mm -hmm. make sense to people kind of um, outputs. Um, and the bravery to make a decision based upon that data um, because it, it, it's kind of the, the information action overload that actually becomes so swamped in data it becomes very very difficult yes, to I actually do anything you mm -hmm. can feel stuck in the mud mm. um, and, and you know kind of thinking towards the future and then is it the computer's job to, to muddle through the, the hard data and for us to then be freed up to have a little bit more thinking space and capacity to be able to make the decisions based upon it. Because mm -hmm. fundamentally, that's why we're here today, is to enable people listening in to be able to make better decisions based on mm -hmm. the, a better quality and type of data. Because mm -hmm. the word, you know, who thinking about data, we used to be thinking, as Louisa said, that it was just tables. It's not anymore. And sort of some data will be more helpful to some people rather than others. The different types of data. I mean, I got really excited when I saw the urban map showing that. And I'd never thought of it as data. And then as soon as when I read Louisa's uh, blog, I was going, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. So thanks for that. Thanks very much for that. Ben, can I come to you on this one? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I guess um, 
I'm always going to say tools and skills are not a barrier. Okay. Culture is the barrier. Wow. Yeah. Um, I would say yeah, yeah. that um, uh, you, we, everybody, everybody involved in public service delivery, including people who are service users or members of the community, um, are going to benefit from uh, increased skills around numeracy, mm -hmm. um, around the interpretation and understanding of data, around the understanding of models. Um, and so, and that's, that's, that's a conveyor belt that's going to keep going. Um, and in general with tools, I bet that the tools that you need in your organization are much less sophisticated and clever than the ones you want. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, yeah. uh, many organizations I've seen that are trying to invest in data pools yeah. and uh, dashboarding software, actually they'd be better off investing in a load of whiteboards. And when the whiteboards become so cumbersome, that they that they, they then move on to some electronic fault, but they it's not the tool that's okay. getting in your way, I don't think. Okay, wow, that's a great perspective to give on that one. Um, couple of, couple of points coming through in terms of tools. How are you feeling? Does that make sense to you? Is this equipping you for what you need to be doing and how you're using data? Come and give us some feedback and let us know about that. I'm conscious of time. I've got a random question that's come in. It's for you, Beth. I'm very sorry about this one. Um, it, it's to talking about the Welsh Government. Well, where, what have I done with it now? Um, here we go. Uh, Welsh Government is going to consult on milestones for the National Wellbeing Indicators. If panels... Sorry, it's for you, Ben. Sorry. Welsh Government is going to consult on milestones for the National Wellbeing Indicators. If the panel was to respond to the consultation, what would you say? Um, so one of the things I would say is milestones is an interesting mental metaphor. I've gone to sort of on the side of the road and I, I can see sort of Cardiff to London in my head now. That's yeah, where my head's so, in. so we use milestones uh, when we have built a road and yeah. we have absolute confidence of how how to get from here to there mm -hmm. and where we are along the way okay um we haven't built that road we have very low confidence we know we know where we want to get to mm -hmm. and we've taken the direction of travel mm -hmm. um if if the intent of those milestones is to uh is to to sit at the metaphorical top of the machine the very top of the world's machine and 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 go right Here's a milestone lever, which I suspect it might, even if okay. that isn't where it starts, I suspect it may, that will be extremely detrimental. Okay. Um, I'd invite the government to think about how it can enable all of those people in the okay. network to be getting steadily better in the right direction. I'm not sure milestones feel like the right model for them. Wow. You heard it here first. We're a critical friend of the world. Absolutely, Government. absolutely. And we've got we've got to get, give it a rounded view at the end of the day. Okay, folks. Right. I'm conscious that we've got a couple more questions coming in. Um, Beth, one in terms of future generations, how does sort of where does data fit in, in everyday life in the future generations office? I'm thinking towards the future, obviously data is increasingly becoming all the more part of our decision making, our understanding of, of an increasingly complex world. Um, and, and again, when, when you bring together the, the seven wellbeing goals, um, no one person's responsible for any single one of them. No. Um, so recognizing that, you know, if, if I'm doing something over in the prosperous Wales, mm -hmm. you know, that traditionally what might have been considered mm -hmm. prosperous Wales, actually how, how might that be having collateral mm -hmm. impact? Mm -hmm. And might data be able to inform us on, on how, what we're doing, the impact we're having and how we might do it better? Okay, yeah, fair comment. Um, Suzanne, Data Camera isn't just for local government, is it? Absolutely not, no. no so sorry. can anyone access this information? Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, okay. Open and access our support as well, absolutely. Okay, great. And Ben, in terms of in terms of Satori Lab and also Open Data Institute, Cardiff ODI, Open Data Institute. Uh, so, yeah, ODI Cardiff um, and Satori Lab, we're on Twitter and web, the web and that sort of thing. Um, open Data uh, ODI Cardiff, we try to um, reflect back. We try to we try to use open data to reflect back what's going on. Okay. I would say in Wales, perhaps there isn't as much open data as there is in other parts of the UK okay. so far. 
You've heard Ben's plea earlier on today about wanting data to be made open. Hopefully you're having an understanding why the need for it is in the benefits, the wider public services and the, and the Wales we went for 2050. I'm going to come to the panel in a minute to ask them what their sort of one key message would be to share with you as delegates today. I'm looking to, I'm turning to you now and asking you this question. Data, it's a damn big topic, mm -hmm. we know that. Where do you want to go next? We appreciate that this um, webinar has had started off really wide. We want to take it to the next step. What is that next step? What can we do to help you take data to enable you to make better decisions for now and for when 2050 and for, for the impact in 2050? Please come and share that with us. You know, you, you know the drill, you know the uh, email addresses, just in case it's good.practiceaudit.wales arve.dat at achwilio.cymru. Put it on the hashtag WODATA18, direct message us, or if you're on the Google Hangouts, please put it on that way. So I've given, I've bought a bit of time now for the <laughs> panel to have a think about what's their one key message to think about. I'm going to ask them to put them themselves in your shoes once again and say, okay, if you were listening in today, what would be our next steps in terms of the one key message you'd want them to take away? I'm going to start with you, Beth, if that's okay. Make data something everyone can um, engage with, get involved with, um, you know, facilitate people who wouldn't usually be around the table talking data um, to engage with it and, and, and understand, you know, their interpretation of it. And it might help you, you know, kind yeah. of produce something more useful in the long run. Definitely. That's brilliant. Thanks, Beth. Ben, what, what, what would your one key message? Bear in mind, you're thinking about their next steps now. Can I have two? <laughs> Go on then. It's a Tuesday. Uh, not? So, I, yeah, I tell you, if you're in a leadership role um, every day, try and make sure that you say, I don't know, uh, as many times as possible. Um, and wherever you are, try and say, try and ask the question, what's the evidence for that as often as possible? You're totally always allowed to have two when you give answers like that. Thank you for that one. Thanks, Ben. Last but not least, um, I, I would echo Beth's sentiment. It's about promote the use of data, make sure you're fostering a culture that you know, buys into the power of data and really understands it. It's the first step on a potentially long journey, but it's, it's the most important. And I would like to end by saying, firstly, thank you to you folks. Great questions. Really, really tested the panel today. I have seen the whites of their eyes, I can assure you. I would just like to say, firstly, thank you to the team behind Jochaval, much appreciated, pushing, helping us get this webinar to the point where it is now. Thank you to you for listening in. Send us your feedback. It's really important because without you, you I'm trying to walk the talk in terms of your shaping where we want to go next. But I'm going to leave you with one message on behalf of the good practice team at the Wales Audit Office in relation to the data webinar. Don't be data driven, be data informed. Thank you very much. This is Ina Lloyd signing off on behalf of the Good Practice Team, Wales Audit Office Cardiff. Diolch yn fawr iawn. Mae'n dair chi gyd.